Arab Tov Khabarim, I'm Stephen Bernoulli, you're watching Israeli News Live, and this afternoon we have uh, Dr. Stephen Pidgeon in with us here, uh, and want to talk to Steve a little bit about Israel burning, and because it has just become a major issue inside the country of Israel there. Uh, we'd shared a little bit of information the other day ourselves about this, and uh, Steve had reached out, uh, sent a letter to me, and, and was telling me about he believes that this may be even prophetically spoken about in the book of Amos. Now, I was actually thinking possibly Amos 4 because I forgot where Steve had spoke about this at. Uh, but um, we have uh, Steve here on Skype and we wanted to get his perspectives about this. Uh, and, and so, Steve, thank you for coming on with us today and sharing your perspectives about uh, Israel and the serious situation of all these fires that are breaking out. Well, it's great to be with you, Stephen. It's great to be on Israeli News Live, of course. And, uh, you know, this situation in Israel is really quite interesting. There have been other fires in Israel. And, of course, you know, any fire in Israel is a cause of great alarm because of all the care that has gone into really the planting of every single tree in the forest that constitutes the wooded areas of, uh, of Israel. And now to see these, these areas being willy-nilly torched is quite alarming. But in this particular case, we're not just talking about a fire. Like a few years back, there was a fire on the, the southern side of Mount Carmel that uh, burned quite a few acres, and people were outraged. But it really didn't change anybody's life significantly. It just uh, took away the beauty of the area. These fires, on the other hand, are something much more significant. They're, you know, it's, it's massive acts of arson all over the country. And these massive acts of arson have torched people's homes. You know, you see huge fireballs uh, blowing up between the apartment buildings in Haifa, for instance. And when I saw the fires, and particularly the, 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 the large, uh, the real large conflagration of flame was really up near Haifa initially, that really alarmed me because of these this passage of scripture that you find in the book of Amos. And... I remember looking at the book of Amos when I was uh, doing some research, and, and uh, I've written extensively on my blogs at uh, safer.net on, uh, on this particular issue. But there's a passage, if you look at Amos 1, it says, The words of Amos, who was among the herdsmen of Tekoa, which he saw concerning Israel in the days of Uzziah, king of, of Judah, and in the days of Yerobam, the son of Yoash, the king of Israel, two years before the earthquake. Okay, now mark that, two years before the earthquake. And he said, Yahweh will roar from Zion and utter his voice from Yerushalayim, and the habitations of the shepherd shall mourn, and what? And the top of Carmel shall wither. Now, <clears throat> so you have this marker now, this prophetic marker that says, you know, essentially when you see the top of Carmel withering, you know that this sequence of events that's going to that's going to follow in this prophecy are going to are going to take place, and so what you see there is Carmel, of course, is you know is the mountain that runs really right from the coast there and uh, runs back through the top of uh, the city of Haifa, you know where the Baha'i Temple is and all that. Oh yes, and run where the Elijah Monument is, where you can look out over the the Valley of uh, Armageddon. And that mountain, of course, has always been one of my favorite spots in Israel because of its greenness, because there's so much woods there. there it's, a, you know, it's a beautiful section. And <clears throat> now you see this very strong marker, a marker that no one in the world can miss, that in fact the top of Carmel is withering. And so once you see that sequence, once you see that, that marker, 
Now take a look at what the rest of Scripture has to say because it gives us a sequence of events that's about to take place, right? In verse 3, for three transgressions of Damascus, and for four, I will not turn the pun away the punishment thereof, because they have threshed the Et Gilad with threshing instruments of iron. Well, you know, I, weren't you just up on that border uh, on uh, between Israel and... Oh, yes. Uh, and... You know that that what they, what they call the Valley of Tears, where all the, the Syrian armament came over to make an invasion into the Golan Heights. I mean, they, they were threshing Gilad with their instruments of iron. And because of that, it's been a while, but now you see that Yah will send a fire into the house of Hazael, which shall devour the palaces of Ben-Hadad. And, uh, of course, you know, Assad is not Ben-Hadad, but, you know, it's not far off. And you see that it talks about breaking the bar of Damascus and, and gets into much more specificity. It says, the people of Aram shall go into captivity. Well, of course, the people of Aram are Syrians, right? And are they going into captivity? Well, what would you call the migration into Turkey? What would you call the migration into Germany? You know, they're living in camps now, right? Sure. So it, they, it's a prison for them because that's exactly what's happening. And I mean... Uh, in fact, if, if, if any of the uh, refugees come to the Czech Republic, uh, I've actually been there to the prison camp that they go to, entire families. Uh, so not many want to come to the Czech Republic because you are put in an actual prison. And of course, like you said, the, the, uh, the, the different camps like that in, uh, over there in, in, in France, right there before you go over into England, right there... Um, um, Calais, 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 France. That's what I'm thinking of there. That has just become a disaster. Yeah, and you know, so you see that they haven't they haven't gone into freedom. They haven't gone into economic opportunity. They have the people of Aram, the the Syrians, have gone into captivity, and so we can see now that uh, you know, and of course we have this issue of Isaiah 17 talking about Damascus being a ruinous heap. And we see that the first judgment that happens uh, following this withering of Carmel is a judgment on Damascus. But from there, in verse 6, you see that we have a, a judgment that's coming on Gaza. A judgment that's coming on Gaza because they carried away the cap captive, the whole of the captivity, to deliver them to Edom. And so what you see there is you see now what, what's going to take place is Israel has labeled these arsonists as terrorists and of course they're talking about draconian sanctions you know we're going to we're going to uh, uh deny your citizenship in israel you know you could get deported out of the country you too could go into captivity but i think ultimately that you're going to see israel is going to take steps they're going to have to take steps to quell the terrorism and that step they're going to take is going to be to send a fire on the wall of gaza which shall devour, devour the palaces thereof uh, and so it won't be an eye for an eye and a tooth for a tooth, but it'll be a flame for a flame. And uh, and again, you know, this this continues to come down. But as if you, when you get to verse nine here, Stephen, you see that now we begin to talk about this battle opening up into Lebanon, right? For three transgressions of Tzor and for four or Tyre, I will not turn away the punishment because they delivered up the captivity to Edom and did not remember their covenant. Well, of course, you know, Tyre, Sidon, you know, that's right now totally occupied by Hezbollah. And you can see that it looks like Israel will be stepping out, not only into Gaza, but also up into southern Lebanon, with fire on the wall, which shall devour the palaces thereof. And so you see that Amos, as we go through this prophecy in both Amos 1 and Amos 2, that you have a sequence of events that appears to place, you know, Israel moving against Gaza, Israel moving against Lebanon. Now, you see also there's three transgressions of Edom. But well, as we talk about this, Stephen, you know that so much of the dynamic in Syria has, you know, Turkish troops moving into the northern end. There was a discussion about Saudi troops potentially making a pincer movement, uh, a pincer movement approach. Uh, to come up through southern Lebanon or even Jordan but to make a southern approach against uh, against uh, Assad's troops in Damascus. And they even poised 350,000 troops on the northern Saudi border 
together with all kinds of F-16s and helicopters and tanks and so on and so forth in preparation for making a major strike against uh, Assad. And again, we talked about this earlier, the interest of Saudi Arabia, Qatar, UAE, Bahrain, and so forth, in getting their natural gas shipped into Europe, which requires a pipeline through Syria, which they cannot get permission to do. But interestingly enough, if Eden begins to move, uh, move against Syria, and they do what they, what they were talking about doing, which is to put troops, stage troops, right through the nation of Jordan. Well, if you look down here, you see that there, there's punishment coming on the children of Ammon. They're in, in, in Amos 1, verse 13. There's punishment that comes on the children of Ammon. And then if you go into chapter 2, you see that there's punishment that comes on Moab. So you see that Jordan is there. And what happens to the king of Ammon? Is he killed? No, not according to this prophecy. He's driven into exile. He's driven into exile. And from there, well, we begin to see now that there's going to be retaliation against Judah and also against Israel. And so I believe that this fire in, in, uh, in Israel, uh, which began with a serious flames in Haifa and up on Mount Carmel, is a signal under Amos 1 that is beginning to set this progression in motion, this progression of war, and how this, you know, a lot of people talk about Psalm 83 and the Confederation happens and so forth, or Ezekiel 38 and the Gog and Magog war, but you cannot ignore what's set out in Amos, because Amos is going to give you a very clear-cut progression of events, and uh, I think the sequence is in motion right now, and uh, so we're, we're going to see exactly how far this escalates and if there is going to be an escalation uh, against Damascus. You know, what's interesting about Amos in the prophecy concerning Damascus is that it doesn't say Damascus will be destroyed, right? Right. It says, I'm going to send fire into the house of Hazael, and w which will devour the palaces of Ben-Hadad, and I will break the bar of Damascus, cut off the inhabitant from the plain of Aben, which is what they're trying to do, is cut off that eastern section of Syria. And him that holds the scepter of the house of Eden and the people of Aram shall go into captivity. So it's not the complete destruction of Damascus, but it shows that Damascus is first and foremost in this sequence and in this prophecy. Absolutely. And you know, another thing, uh, as, you, as you mentioned, Stephen, there's, there's so many different things that we see that are clear, signs of the hour that we live in. And uh, when I spoke about this last night, one of the things that I reminded the people of, and that is uh, uh, over in uh, Ezekiel, Ezekiel chapter 35, verse 5, when it says, Because thou hast had a hatred of old, speaking about Esau, uh, and hurled the children of Israel into the power of the sword in the time of their calamity and the time that their iniquity uh, uh, would have an end. And... This was something I saw that clearly was uh, prophetic about uh, both one Ezekiel seeing that uh, Jerusalem would collapse in 70 AD when Titus, the Roman general, came, come down, came down. Uh, he used the Syrian military in order to help uh, put Israel to the sword, which is referred to in Obadiah as their calamity. Uh, and then we find the time, the iniquity uh, of the end, that's definitely identified in um, over in the book of uh, Daniel, chapter 9, when we see that Israel, you know, their iniquity, their sins will be forgiven. And here we are in this day here, and we have what they call the third intifada. And what did they do? They used the power of the sword in the beginning of that. Uh, and then as that came along, and I, and I, you know, after you had sent me the message about this, about uh, being in Amos, and I wasn't sure exactly where it was at because I didn't go back to look at the email at the time. Um, so I began to look myself, you know, I, I hadn't even thought that there would be a possibility of a fire that could actually be uh, something from a prophetic standpoint, but pretty much anything when you're dealing with Israel has uh, prophecy written all over it. And so I just kind of did a little bit of a search there, and the one that really caught my attention was over in Isaiah chapter 1. And even though we know that Isaiah chapter 1 is speaking of a time that's already happened, it's under the time of, the, you know, during the... Uh, the time when Hezekiah and Ahaz, when these were the kings of Judah. But uh, then he goes in there, he speaks about them rebelling against him. 
etc. But then he talks about how that the, the all the cities were on fire. Um, mm -hmm. And I just could not help but think of that. Uh, it says, uh, I believe, verse 7, your country is desolate. Your cities are burned with fire. Your land, strangers devoured in your presence. And it is desolate as overthrown by floods. And that's exactly what's happening. Not only is it being burned, Stephen, but also they, the, you know, strangers, the the, the Gentiles have come in, the United Nations, whether it be the United Nations, presidents of different countries, the Vatican, everybody's just trying to hack up Israel and give it to somebody else. And, oh, sure. You know, so you, you know, when you talk about that, Stephen, you know, I, I did a lot of work on uh, uh, the research on UN Resolution S-181, which was passed on November 29, 1947, that essentially was an edict to go out and rebuild Jerusalem, if you will. It was an edict to restore the nation of Israel. And in that edict, if you go back and look at S-181, they do carve out Jerusalem as an international city. That is to say, it was not to be under the jurisdiction of Israel, of the nation of Israel, but to be an international city. And they have well-defined borders that are articulated in that resolution. And they talk about the kind of authority that's going to govern in there, uh, so on and so forth. So it's very easy for them to point back to S-181 and say, this was the original intention that was violated in the 67 war and so on and so forth. Therefore, we have the right to reinstate this. And this is what, you know, the, what the Oslo Accords are all about too, which is to try to go back to a 67 a boundary issue and to try to reestablish Jerusalem as this international city. Now, of course, the Pope, which is so alarming, this is what's so alarming about what the Pope has done, that the Pope has allowed Muslims to pray inside the Vatican. And he himself has prayed inside a mosque. Now. When you put those two together, you're talking about, first of all, if you pray inside of a mosque, then you are, uh, you know, you're, you're Muslim. You've converted, yeah. to the, you've converted to the faith. Under Islamic law, you're Muslim. And if you allow imams to pray inside the building, that becomes Dar es Salaam. It becomes part of the Islamic world. It's it, Islamic turf. So you have the Pope willingly yield the Vatican in Rome to Islam why would he yield the Vatican in Rome to Islam? Because he has a second Vatican planned in the walled city of Jerusalem. And, you know, and so this plan to initiate this, to recapture the, the walled city of Jerusalem as the second Vatican, which of course would become a first Vatican, is now in full motion because of course there is going to be this building of the second temple. You know, when you read Daniel 9.24 in the Et Sefer, you see that it talks about the end of the 924, it says, and what will take place is the anointing of the Holy of Holies. Of course, in the Hebrew, it's Kodesh Kodeshim. But in most English translations, it says, for to anoint the most holy. But Kodesh Kodeshim, Kodesh Kodeshim, the Kodeshim is the plural, Holy of Holies. And so I believe that passage is talking about a third temple. And if yes. it's talking about a third temple, then we see this realization, really, as being predicted in the year 2017, when this Holy of Holies will be anointed again, and this Holy of Holies, be, and you see now the impetus is full bore. You have Trump on board, you have Putin on board for a third temple. Trump is going to immediately name Jerusalem as the capital of Israel and move the embassy to the city. Uh, another significant move. And again, I think you're going to see this push. I think you're right on it. In, in your summary of what's happening with the Vatican in terms of their push to say our Vatican is going to be Jerusalem. It is not going to be in no, no longer Rome. And they may be setting this up for that to happen as well, Steve, because, you know, there's the Pope has allowed certain refugees to come into the country uh, that have, well, not so much allowed, you know, they're just basically the southern border has been open for the, for the uh, different ISIS members that are coming in from uh, Libya that are crossing the Mediterranean Sea there. And I have a, a, a strange suspicion, especially since we've seen in the news recently, that they're talking about taking over the Vatican. And he may even allow this to happen to give him the excuse to move the operation over to Jerusalem, which kind of brings into question, why Jerusalem? What is special about Jerusalem? Of course, we know what's special about it, but for him to fulfill his prophecy, you have to understand, we know that there's biblical prophecy, 
but we have to also look like look as the way the late Joel Bannerman said, uh, who wrote about the Vatican. He says most Jews never consider what the Vatican's theology is for the end of days. And as Joel pointed out, they want to take over Jerusalem, and they're going to make sure that all the events that are happening in the world are fulfilling prophecy the way they see it. And I think this is a dangerous situation, uh, at, at the very least. Oh, yeah, and I think also you're going to see that uh, the capitulation in Israel, you know, you can handle an attacking army. Uh, you can even handle the, the you know, the, the Israel's putting up of the fence, you know, to try to contain sniper fire and to try to uh, thwart uh, suicide bombings. You know, the fence worked pretty well. It really cut down a lot of it. But, you know, what do you do when they when they start torching the whole country? I mean, how do you stop the arson? And, uh, and there's going to be more uh, events like this to the point that the government of Israel is going to be overwhelmed, continuing to seek peace trying to find some means to find peace. And, you know, ultimately the solution is going to be given to the, to the people over and over again. Well, your solution is to have a third temple. And, of course, you and I both know, I mean, I've seen the CAD markup of the temple, and it's not Solomon's temple, and it's not even a design. It may look like Solomon's temple from the outside, but from the inside it is not Solomon's temple. And yeah. they've, they've, there's already been sacrifices on an on a uncut uh, uh, stone altar, and the you know the the, the Sanhedrin is reformed. The uh, the uh, Gadul Kohen has been appointed. Uh, the Levite priests are are you know are actually doing the oblations. You know everything is in place. The only thing that remains to be done is for the sanctification using the ashes of the red heifer and for the construction of the building. And I believe they're going to get approval on that. That approval is going to happen early, early in in 2017. And once the approval is done, it's, it, it will be erected and anointed before we get to the end of the calendar year, the biblical calendar year in 2017. I believe it. I believe it. And I can see that coming for sure, Steve. Uh, Steve, I appreciate uh, the input you've given tonight on this and uh, want to get this out to the people tonight and everything because of the things that are going on. Do you have any other uh, last thoughts that you'd like to share with, the, with our listeners here? Well, you know, I just uh, I think the listeners need to be prepared uh, for all the events that, that are coming around them. You know, back during the days of Stalin, you know, he had a saying, you know, two steps forward, one step backward. And at the times when things are calm, you need to remember, the people need to remember that we can be in the one step backward phase while the new world, or, or, while the new world order uh, is preparing two steps forward over the top of us. So people need to keep their eyes open and their and, and their ears uh, listening, and in most particularly, they need to listen to the word of the heavenly Father who is speaking to everyone, and they need to they need to open their ears and hear it, drop their stiff necks and their hearts of stone, and bring into them into their life a heart of flesh so that grace might reach them, so that they might understand what is happening in these end days. Amen. Couldn't agree more. Thank you, Steve. God bless you. Thank you for those of you that have been listening here. And uh, check out uh, Steve's website. Steve is, uh, uh, him and Brad Huckins are, they, they have put together what is called the Sefer Bible. It is uh, an amazing work. Uh, it's taken a no, quite a number of years for them to put this together, but it's, it's become very well known. Uh, uh, it's done a lot of restoration of, of the Hebraic names that we find in the Bible, as well as brought back some of uh, the books that we see mentioned in our own Bible, such as we find in the book of Samuel, the book of Jasher mentioned, or Yasher, however you want to pronounce that. Uh, you see the book of Ezra brought back in, different books that are, you know, that, that were part of canon, or either like in the case of the book of Enoch, which is still part of the Ethiopic scriptures, part of the Jewish Bible at one time, as we find from uh, what we had discovered from the Qumran scrolls, when several copies of, or fragments of copies that were found at Qumran, uh, including one complete copy that ended up disappearing and ended up over, I believe it was in Kuwait or Qatar, I forget which country it ended up in there, but uh, it, it is an amazing work that they have worked on. They've, they've done an, uh, more than one addition to this now, and I think it would be a blessing to you. And, and uh, Stephen, what's the, what's the website there where people can actually order the Sefer? It is sefer.net, C-E-P-H-E-R.net. 
and it's a very easy process to order both the book and also you can uh, you can download the app as well. Amen, amen. And I think that, that I've still got to get the app. I've got the book. I just need to get the app. Anyway, God bless you. Thank you for watching. And shalom. Arab Tov Khabrim, I'm Stephen Bernoulli, you're watching Israeli News Live, and this afternoon we have uh, Dr. Stephen Pigeon in with us here, uh, and wanted to talk to Steve a little bit about Israel burning, and because... ...you know that this sequence of events that's going to, that's going to follow in this prophecy are going, to, are going to take place, and so what you see there is Carmel, of course, is, you know, is the mountain that runs really right from the coast there and uh, runs back through the top of uh, the city of Haifa, you know, where the Baha'i Temple is and all that. Oh, yes. And run down to where the Elijah Monument is, where you can look out over the, the valley of uh, Armageddon. And that mountain, of course, has always been one of my favorite spots in Israel because of its greenness, because there's so much woods there. there it's, uh, you know, it's a beautiful section. And <clears throat> now you see this very strong marker a marker that no one in the world can miss, that in fact the top of Carmel is withering. And so once you see that sequence, once you see that, that marker, now take a look at what the rest of Scripture has to say because it gives us a sequence of events that's about to take place, really the planting of every single tree in the forest that constitutes the wooded areas of, uh, of Israel. And now to see these, these areas being willy-nilly torched is quite alarming but in this particular case we're not just talking about a fire like a few years back there was a fire on the, the southern side of mount carmel that uh, burned quite a few acres and people were outraged but it really didn't change anybody's life significantly it just uh, took away the beauty of the area these fires on the other hand are something much more significant there you know it's it's massive acts of arson all over the country and these massive acts of arson have torched people's homes. You know, you see huge fireballs uh, blowing up between the apartment buildings in Haifa, for instance. And when I saw the fires, and particularly the, 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 the large, uh, the real large conflagration of flame was really up near Haifa initially. It has just become a major issue inside the country of Israel there. Uh, we'd shared a little bit of information the other day ourselves about this, and uh, Steve had reached out, uh, sent a letter to me, and, and was telling me about, he believes that this may be even prophetically spoken about in the book of Amos. Now, I was actually thinking possibly Amos 4, because I forgot where Steve had spoke about this at, uh, but um, we have uh, Steve here on Skype, and we wanted to get his perspectives about this. Uh, and, and so, Steve, thank you for coming on with us today and sharing your perspectives about uh, Israel and the serious situation of all these fires that are breaking out. Well, it's great to be with you, Stephen. It's great to be on Israeli News Live, of course. And, uh, you know, this situation in Israel is really quite interesting. There have been other fires in Israel. And, of course, you know, any fire in Israel is a cause of great alarm because of all the care that has gone into that really alarmed me because of these this passage of scripture that you find in the book of Amos and 
I remember looking at the Book of Amos when I was uh, doing some research, and, and uh, I've written extensively on my blogs at uh, Safer.net on uh, on this particular issue. But there's a passage, if you look at Amos 1, it says, The words of Amos, who was among the herdsmen of Tekoa, which he saw concerning Israel in the days of Uzziah, king of, of Judah, and in the days of Yerobam, the son of Yoash, the king of Israel, two years before the earthquake. Okay, now mark that, two years before the earthquake. And he said, Yahweh will roar from Zion and utter his voice from Yerushalayim, and the habitations of the shepherd shall mourn, and what? and the top of Carmel shall wither. Now, <clears throat> so you have this marker now, this prophetic marker that says, you know, essentially when you see the top of Carmel, 